the G3 Church Network exists to allow churches with similar theological and philosophical convictions to join together for cooperative church planting, the production of practical local church resources, and mutual encouragement. Network churches are added to our church map, enjoy conference discounts, and benefit from cooperation with other like-minded churches. If you are a conservative Baptist church with Reformed soteriology and ecclesiology, we would love for you to join us in the G3 Church Network. Visit g3min.org network to apply. Articles from G3 Ministries John Gill and the Two Witnesses in Revelation Written by Chipley McQueen Thornton Everyone wants to know, who are the two witnesses in Revelation 11? Moses and Elijah, Enoch and Elijah, James and John, Peter and Paul. Gill suggests they are not two individuals, but rather two parties. Number one, gospel ministers, and number two, gospel congregations. To catch his drift, you must understand his prophetic timeline. Gill's Prophetic Timeline As we've detailed prior, Gill sees Revelation as prophetic eras the church must endure. The church already has passed through the first five trumpet judgments. We currently are under the sixth trumpet, and the seventh trumpet is yet future. In his purview, the church currently is in the Sardis Church era, in which true congregations have separated from the Roman Catholic church and are spreading slowly like leaven. The rise, fall, and resurrection of the two witnesses will mark the beginning of the spiritual reign of Christ and inaugurate the Philadelphia church era in which the gospel will surge worldwide so that the world's kingdom will become Christ's. To finish out his timeline, there will be a cooling effect during the Laodicean church era in which the church will become lukewarm just before Christ's glorious appearance at His second coming. In the larger prophetic context, he sees several things happening as history transitions from the Sardis church era to the glorious Philadelphia church era. He lays this out in his chapter entitled, On the Spiritual Reign of Christ. One, the two witnesses begin the destruction of Antichrist, Rome pagan and papal, which allows the gospel to flow unhindered. Two, the mass conversion of the Jews spoken of in Romans 11 occurs. Three, a worldwide gospel surge occurs in which the elect Gentiles assist the recently converted Jewish nation in a, quote, spread great spread of the gospel, close quote, throughout the earth. The kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ, though there will be a brief apostasy, the Laodicean church era, just before his glorious appearing. Since we presently are in the Sardis church era, the two witnesses, gospel ministers and gospel congregations are still bearing testimony to the world, in effect, weakening Antichrist by the proclamation of the gospel. He states, quote, The witnesses have not finished their testimony. They are still prophesying in sackcloth, close quote. They will be killed, but not literally. Rather, Their ability to bear witness will be killed as they are silenced, banished, and isolated by Antichrist, Rome pagan, and papal. Once this occurs, the church on earth will rise victoriously in the Philadelphia church era with sweeping conversions that permeate kings, princes, governments, and entire nations. Gill often calls this period the latter-day glory or the spiritual reign of Christ. Reflections Again, we are starting to see how Gill's earlier interpretive decisions cause him difficulties. 
His decision to see the book as forecasting prophetic eras requires that he spiritualize or allegorize the specific details that don't fit. Let me provide a few examples. First, the most natural reading of the two witnesses in Revelation is that they are two persons. Yet Gill's earlier interpretive decisions pigeonhole him into naming two historical persons that fit their description. Yet we find no historical persons who rose up with those powers over plagues and natural phenomena, much less who died, rose again, and ascended into heaven. This complicates things for him. Therefore, he spiritualizes the two witnesses as two parties. Yet that only complicates matters more. Second, neither of the two parties, gospel ministers or gospel churches, were killed and rose again. Therefore, he has to redefine the killed as banished or silenced. Third, their dead bodies lying in the street for three and a half days is impossible under Gill's purview. The days must refer to years. He says, quote, It will not be possible that in so short a time the news of the slaying of the witnesses should be spread among the inhabitants of the earth, close quote. See Gill's comments on Revelation 11, verse 9. Fourth, their ascension into heaven, he says, is mystical. It refers to the glorious state of the church in the Philadelphia era. Fifth, the earthquake which killed 7,000 in Jerusalem cannot be literal, because historically we read of no such event. Therefore, the earthquake is symbolic for civil upheaval. The 7,000 represents, quote, a certain for an uncertain, close quote, number. And the city is not Jerusalem, but either Rome or Great Britain or France. All of this is problematic on many levels. Yet the problem began when Gill took a hard position on chapters 2 and 3 regarding prophetic history. Once he did that, he had to pinpoint actual historical events and connect them to textual data points to justify that decision. The further he got into Revelation, the more that interpretive framework began to collapse. Perhaps the most outlandish is his suggestion that Great Britain is where the two witnesses will lie dead in the street because the gospel ministers and gospel churches were most prominent in the northern part of Europe and the Antichrist was seeking to silence them. Again, Gill seems to take a myopic view, being influenced too much by his own times and historical milieu. Nevertheless, we've made it through the present church era. Now Gill's perceived exegetical problems will become easier to navigate as the seventh trumpet looks to the future.